Great. Welcome, everybody. Uh, this event is a part of San Francisco Mensa Speaker Series, and we have a great speaker today. Um, my name is Pia Smith. I am the host and moderator of the talk today, and uh, today's speaker is Mensa member George Fuller. Uh, please put any questions that you may have uh, while he's speaking, and then we'll take questions at the end. Um, George today will discuss the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, and why it took America so long to give civil rights to this uh, minority of Americans. In former lives, George served as a sergeant in the LAPD and uh, taught special ed. These days, he serves as a city council member for the city of Oakley, among other things. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, George Fuller. Hi everyone, I'm George Fuller and it's a pleasure to be here. I'll start with uh, the what I have learned is best in terms of uh, disability and that's to say my pronouns are he, him, there. And I wanna acknowledge the Bay Miwok Nation that but I inhabited the lands that I live on now, which is Oakley, California. I am a male white with blonde hair, glasses. Uh, in my golden years with a white beard and Aloha shirt with a, that's black with a red floral design going down it. I, uh, in the back is a wood room divider and also a art piece room divider of a base with grass sticking out of it or fonts. Um, I say that because if we have anyone visually impaired that we, uh, that you know who I am and what I look like. Start out with, I'm George Fuller and I just blew it. Judy Younger is also working on technical expertise along with Pia, I appreciate it. And what we're working on today is a primer read with the Americans with Disabilities Act. I call it a primer read and I started it with the idea that the ADA or Americans with Disabilities Act from my experience, from my background and what I've come across is um, a very important document as to the civil rights of disabled people in the United States. However, it's one of the most misunderstood in terms of civil rights is in my perception and in others. Uh, so I want to break it down into smaller pieces, smaller chunks, perhaps come back. People are there, but make it easier to understand the impact of what ADA is. We may not be a full hour. I don't know, but we'll, I don't want to bore and confuse people by a whole lot of information that's sometimes can be technical. So we do have Closed captioning is provided, Pia just said, if you go down to the bottom and hit live transcript, it will come up. You can save the transcript afterwards or at any time during it by hitting save, it goes to your computer uh, and you can read it later. And all pictures are alt captioned. And is any, uh, can I see in chat, can anybody respond? Do they, can they describe what alt captioning is? just for the start. I don't. Okay. Um, everything that you're saying is showing up on the bottom of my screen in a black box with white writing. And I have a, I think medium size, it's, I can read it pretty well easily. I could make it bigger. Okay, no, that's, I appreciate that. What uh, what all pictures all pictures are all captioning is just like Judy said. I've written a description of the picture in into the uh, PowerPoint, and if you're using the screen reader, it comes across and describes the picture. In this case, it's a lion cub laying on a rock with grass around it in a purple cloud or haze. So uh, as you go through, you'll see that. It's another item that we use uh, to assist disabled people that are visually impaired to, in, uh, to be a participant with the entire PowerPoint and all the slides. So we're only gonna focus today 
on the American with Disabilities Act. There's several others. There's an Educational um, Handicap Act of 1973, which IDEA came out of. There's Section 504. There's many others, but we're going to concentrate on the American with Disabilities Act and stay focused on that. I wrote down a few things that make things easier for us, I think. All questions will and comments are tacked. I typed into the chat, Judy and Pia will monitor the, the chat and keep us informed of those questions on, and comments. Uh, remain on mute, if you would. We have a lot to cover and interruptions um, that come about that, well, we don't want to be going off, off track and into another area that we'll use a lot of time. We will be civil with one another. We will be non-judgmental of others and we will be non-judgmental of the ADA. And it's probably the toughest one. Keep in mind, I am not an attorney. My presentation is based on my education, experience, and training. I, have, I do not want to say that, well, this, this is absolutely true in terms of legal context, but I can provide a direction and information. If you do run into legal information uh, dispute, my suggestion is contact an attorney, um, go there. So it gives you some background of where to proceed and how to go about it and people use this. But over time, I want everybody to understand I am not an attorney, I'm not licensed to practice law. And this is based on my education experience and training. My positionality, and I think this is important for everyone to know where I'm coming from in terms of the ADA so that you understand where I, I, my mind is. People will disagree with me. People will disagree with me vehemently, but this is my idea and where I am in terms of the ADA. I am disabled and work with a Norwegian Elk Hound service dog. I'm Ivar. I'm completing my dissertation for a doctor of education degree, special education University of San Francisco. I am a city council member sitting on the city of Oakley, California City Council. I served three terms, three four-year terms, 12 years on the West Covina Unified School District School Board. I have a master's of arts degree in special education from California State University of Los Angeles. I am a retired special age education teacher with over 22 years of teaching. I have two children who were born with disabilities and my youngest child, Daniel, died around eight years ago at the age of 22, in large part because of his disability. I also have a nonprofit that isn't as strong as I would like right now, but it, uh, that assists to assist as we go forward after my doctor to assist disabled students of colleges. Why do I bring this all up? Because I support the ADA. I really support the ADA. And so I want people to understand that I have a bias here when I'm presenting it. I use identity first language, and this is a big one within the dis disabled community, but it's, it's something that's has become very sensitive to disabled people in many areas. I use identity first language. I am a disabled person, not a person with a disability. My identity is a disabled person, I present myself as a disabled person. I conduct, I go through um, all my actions in the community, access to the community as a disabled person. My identity is a disabled person among others. So I, I put that first. All right. So the next few slides will involve uh, material with the American with Disabilities Act of 1990 as amended with ADA Amendment Acts of 2008. You can see the uh, URL up there that's available uh, by the end of the meeting. I hope to have that up there in the chat, but that's where you, I'm getting information that's my reference comes to. So where did we find the ADA? I think the significant, we find it in the public health and welfare, Title 42 
of United States legislation. We find it under public health and welfare laws and considerations. It's Title 42, and out of that, Chapter 126, Equal Opportunities for Individuals with Disabilities. This is what contains it right now, where, where you can go, you can draw it up on the URL, and it, it is a lengthy document, which is why I broke, broke it down, but this is where it, it came about. It exists out of the United States Congress and was passed by it. So let's start. So when the United States Congress got together, if you can believe this, bipartisan, and put together the ADA, one of the first things that they established is what are the findings in regards to disability? They went and listed these, and I'll give them to you. First, physical or mental disabilities in no way diminish a person's right to fully participate in all aspects of society. Yet many people with physical or mental disabilities have been precluded from doing so because of discrimination. Others who have a record of a disability are regarded as having a disability also have been subjected to discrimination. I think one of the is here, whether or not one has a disability, these people who are viewed as having a disability have been suggested, uh, subjected to discrimination. It seems elementary, but this is one of the things that came about that disabled people, when they wrote this, the physical and mental disabilities do not diminish a person's capability uh, to uh, to right to fully participate in all aspects of society, and that they have been recruited but with discrimination. So, in other words, I've had people argue, "Well, everybody's welcome, and we're all here. That's great." But the Congress says this is what our findings were, and this led to the law that we're here that we have historically. Society has tended to isolate and segregate individuals with disability. And despite some improvements, such forms of discrimination against individuals with disabilities continues to be a serious and pervasive social problem. The way that since the turn of the 20, uh, 20th century, the way that people with disabilities have been handled is to institutionalize them. It's a horrid thing. We can look at it later in another meeting, but it was a horrid way to go. We continue to isolate them. And Latterman State Hospital, which was a developmental disabled uh, state hospital for developmentally disabled persons where they remain the rest of their lives, was still operational into the 1990s, despite, operate, uh, despite legislation. They finally closed that one down in California. But it, the situation was, we will move them to, um, to an institution and we'll keep them there because that's the best thing for them and they're unable to take care of themselves. So that was established by the Congress. Okay. All right, now discrimination against, number three, discrimination against individuals with disability persists in such critical areas as employment, housing, public accommodations, education, trans transportation, communication, recreation, institutionalization, health services, voting, and access to public services. In other words, throughout society, discrimination exists. It's not a matter of, oh, well, do we really dis uh, discriminate with the U.S. Congress? Yes, we do discriminate with individuals against disabilities. And they acknowledge that within the American Disabilities Act, which um, led us to, well, we hear this is an actual picture, as you can see, going down the stairs without a ramp. And this is what you had to do. And you can imagine if somebody was, uh, say, 70 years old using a wheelchair, they wouldn't be going down the stairs at all. 
on, on, and you can imagine a person saying, well, yeah, you can have a job and we'll be glad to pay you, but you got to get here. And then this is what you have to go through. So they acknowledged that there was discrimination throughout all areas of society with uh, disability, leading on to section uh, four, unlike individuals who have experienced discrimination on the basis of race, color, sex, national origin, religion, or age, individuals who have experienced discrimination on the basis of disability have often had no legal recourse to redress such discrimination. That is a major one. How many are, can we have it by a show of thumbs, how many are aware of eugenics that existed in the United States? Can you have a show of thumbs? Just thumbs? I'm not seeing it. Okay, eugenics existed in the United States. And what that meant was back in the 1920s, and there was a Gradier doctor who eventually went on to Germany to help create the Holocaust, but in the United States, an American doctor said the best way to handle, uh, handle discrimination, to handle disability is to eliminate it from the genes, to eliminate it from, from society. So they came up with this great job, this great thought that we will sterilize all disabled people. And that will do it because then they won't have any children, then discriminations will come together. There was no legal recourse. They tried to have legal recourse, but it went into up in about the 1930s, Justice Holmes, one of our greatest justices said, well, these people are imbeciles, they're burdens on society. You can force them to be uh, sterilized and they have no legal option. So in the United States, we forcibly sterilized 70,000 people. With women, they thought that uh, giving them anesthetic would be uh, detrimental to them in terms of having their ovarian tubes cut so they were given, they were cut without anesthetic. There aren't really movies but, or films of it, but when you see it, you see a woman tied down and you can see the doctor stand over and put the scalpel to them and their legs start kicking. So, and they had no legal recourse. They had nowhere to go. If um, there was a young woman, we'll come back to in another session, but who was six years old, went into uh, a, restaurant in Denver prior to the uh, prior about 1985 but she, and she had a cerebral palsy upper body spasticity and she was uh, had difficulty controlling her arms and putting eating putting food up to her mouth with a spoon and she went into a restaurant in Denver to have dinner the waitress looked at her and said, honey, nobody in here wants to watch you eat. And they were turned away. Now she became an activist and I'll tell you how it impacted her. Her first arrest for being an activist was at the age of seven. At the age of eight, she crawled up the stairs of the Congress in an attempt to have George H.W. Bush, who did sign it eventually, sign the American with Disabilities Act. But prior to that, she, if the restaurant didn't want to allow her because she had uh, upper body spasticity and it was repulsive to the waitress, they had to go. They had to go. So this was a big one. They left them with a re, uh, legal recourse. Census data, national polls, and other studies have documented that people with disabilities as a group occupy an inferior status in our society and severely disadvantaged socially, vocationally, economically, and educationally. And this is a common sight, even on today's campus. Here we have a group of children or young, young um, maybe teenagers, having a good time sitting among themselves. And here's a person in a wheelchair off to their side, and they generally get sent off. Um, 
if you look at how special ed kids are brought to school, they're brought in the bus, as you're aware, usually segregated. And very often, if you look at it, the entrance, the front entrance, they do not use. The elder children come in the front entrance, they are often taken around to the back and unloaded there, and they leave the bus and go directly into a special day class where they're segregated from the rest of the school. And so historically, this is what, um, and we have documentation that Congress says, this is a truism, it exists. So, okay. First, so okay, number seven and eight. Congress said the nation's proper goals regarding individuals with disabilities are to assure equality of opportunity, full participation, independent living, and economic self sufficiency for such individuals and the continuing existence of unfair and unnecessary discrimination and prejudice denies people with disabilities the opportunity to compete on an equal basis to pursue those opportunities for which our free society is justifiably famous and cost the United States billions of dollars in unnecessary uh, expenses resulting from dependency and non-productivity. And Congress says, this is a truism. This is what exists. We find that this is true, okay? Now, okay, what is the major impact of the findings, okay, as I mentioned, and this is one of the critical ones I think I tried to bring about, they are truism as legislated into law by the United States Congress. In other words, the findings are legally indisputable. If someone is sued or found to be in some civil rights of an individual, they look at the act that was committed against them in violation of the American Disabilities Act. But the person or the company or the corporation can't walk into court and say, well, they have no reason to feel that they're discriminated because the United States doesn't discriminate individuals. These were major findings that were clearly said, dis disabled people are discriminated against and suffer because of the discrimination. So that the legal defense, and again, I'm not a lawyer, but the legal defense is they're not, no. Congress says to the judge that these are truisms, they're indisputable, we have acknowledged them in, in there. So when you're making the rendering, do not make it on the basis that people are not discriminated against in the United States, because we believe that is false. They are discriminated against, okay? Now, what was the purpose of all of it? The purpose was of this chapter, remember we're down, down the, uh, the chapter in terms of public health, it comes there. It was to provide a clear and comprehensive national, national mon mandate for the elimination of the discrimination against individuals with disabilities. Congress said, Within the nation, we're going to have a comprehensive national man mandate to eliminate discrimination. And as you can see here, hate was blocked out. That was a major point. It can't be that, oh no, we, we aren't gonna worry about it in Arkansas. No, throughout the nation, any disabled person can go where his territories and not feel discrimination, okay? The second one is to provide clear, strong, consistent, enforceable standards to addressing discrimination against the individuals with disability. Now, for me, with a service dog, this becomes very important because a service dog, you cannot refuse to have a service dog in a restaurant because a person is allergic to dogs. And you can't say uh, to an individual, 
that you can't come in with a wheelchair because it's a fire hazard. And people say that, but the biggest one, like I've been to churches and the thing is, is the ADA does not apply to religious organizations. When I'm in church with a um, service stop, there are people coming up, well, can you move away because it's allergic? Well, this person's been around the dog forever, it seems like, but all of a sudden they're allergic. It, that is not a defense to make a person with a service dog to leave. If a decision has to be made, the person with the allergy has to relocate. We need to find a place for them. But, so that becomes strong, consistent, enforceable standards that people can't manipulate into the discriminatory, uh, discriminatory aspect. I had a person in school that actually threw his backpack at the bar the second time, second class it was with it. Uh, in college that threw a backpack at him because he was afraid of dogs. So he didn't want the dog in the classroom and that's the way he expressed it. I got to stay in the classroom. He left the classroom. That was, and they had a big ha, but that's the way it is. It was clear and consistent and enforceable that I could walk in there even though the person was afraid of dogs. So, and using that excuse, okay. To ensure the federal government plays a central role in enforcing the standards established in the chapter on behalf of individuals with disabilities. Anybody else know where this comes in? Write it in the chat. Anybody? Little Rock, Arkansas. Okay. Civil Rights Act of 1964. It's Little Rock, Arkansas. Actually, it's Little Rock, Arkansas. It was 1957. Eisenhower nationalized the uh, National Guard after um, Orgel Favis tried to uh, use the National Guard to block the uh, African-Americans from entering Central High and said, no, the federal government plays a central role in enforcing the standards. And the same applies to disability. If a person has a, a complaint, they can find out with the Office of Civil Rights in the United States Justice Department are in terms of education within the Department of Education, but the federal government plays a major role in enforcing the standards. And they have, of course, lots of resources. So one last person to invoke the sweep, sweep of congressional authority, including the power to enforce the 14th Amendment to regulate commerce in order to address the major areas of discrimination faced day to day by people of disabilities. And I'm gonna stop there. Maybe there'll be a part two if you'd like me to come back, but I'm gonna stop right there because this is a really the blood and guts of the ADA. You can see that it's for, written very forcibly and very decisively that disabled people are discriminated against and we intend to that in the terms of the federal government to see that that does not happen and we're going to put our money where our mouth is and enforce it so uh it's fairly strong and it seems very direct but for me as a disabled person when i get on a bus in san francisco i get to get on the bus and i get to sit down and there are tourists on the bus that kind of look at me kind of crazy, and that's too bad. <laughs> I sit down with my dog and put it there. Now that may seem cold, but that's that's where we are. That uh, is there. So, Pia and Judy, maybe maybe we can. If somebody wants to raise their thumb and ask a question, um, there comment. are a couple of questions. I can I can read them, and then if there's some clarification, the the okay. answer can uh, clarify. Okay. Um, so I find it interesting that you identify yourself as disabled rather than a person first. Um, you seem to be acting more like a person who has a disability, but you're not, but you are, are not letting that define you or limit you. Uh, how, what does a disabled person mean to you personally? Well, to me personally, what it means is that I am disabled. I have, and we didn't get into the description, uh, 
the legal definition of disability too, that would be another one, but I am disabled. I have an impairment. I don't necessarily need to do, say that, but I have an impairment and there, uh, in fact, actually more than one, uh, mostly is balanced. If you want one of them is balanced, that keeps me upright. But I have an impairment that limits me in my life. I, but my mind is good, uh, even if it wasn't good. Even if I had a mental illness, I am entitled to live in this society and have access to it and not to be shut, shut aside. So I act myself, I become productive. I continue to be productive and I continue to step forward. Uh, people ask me, what do you do with your service dog when I'm sitting on a council dais? And I say, well, he just crawls underneath the dais and goes to sleep. So he allows me to be out there. He allows me to go, but I am a person that can carry, uh, that that's my, my recognition. One of the reasons, here I'll lower it, uh, just a minute, let's, how do I lower the, um, the share? Do what? The share, share screen. How do I open that? I just did it for you. Okay. <laughs> In other words, okay. Um, I want people to be able to see, and I see people. But hey, when I, why I say, here's where the dispute comes from. We, and I having in special ed is very much important, but we say, and have been saying, a person with a disability. What does that mean? It means, well, we, you've got something to hide. You don't, we don't want to embarrass you. We don't want you to look down on you. So we'll say you're a real person, but you got a disability, which marginalizes us, marginalizes a person. In other words, I become marginalized. I'm a person, but I got some hinky stuff about me. No, I am a disabled person and I, should be able to go about as part of my identity. Now, but about day school, uh, K-12 gets into big arguments, some others, but K-12, I do believe um, like a child with autism. And one of the reasons why I say that is that teachers can be just downright cruel. And I've been working with students and a student teacher comes up to me and I said, I wish you'd take Johnny. And I say, why? And they say, well, he's autistic. He's an autistic child. He doesn't belong in this, in my room. No, he's a child. He belongs in your room and you need to learn to work with him. It's what I bas basically come about and I can assist you. But he's the, it's kind of like, bah, he's an autistic child. That is not proper. So it goes there. So it goes there. So, and it is, there's a lot of people that argue it back and forth. There's a lot of people that are not disabled that become uncomfortable saying it. But basically what the argument is, it be marginalizes. I'm identified like, okay, he's, um, he's a Latinx male because he's from south of the border and he's a, he's a male, okay? But we don't say male with Latinx blood because that kind of marginalizes them. So he's a part of his identity is he came from a Latinx heritage. So you go there. What's the other question? Um, um, uh, somebody is, uh, hi George, thank you for the presentation. Can you tell us more about how the feds enforce and address quote, major areas of discrimination faced day to day by people with disabilities, unquote? Yes, the most important area is out of the Office of Civil Rights and they investigate it. Now, is it easy? The person has to write down what's happening. They have to get a hold of the Office of Civil Rights. They have to put it in. But once it's, they investigated, and if they find the person's rights have been violated, they call for um, correction, and the person who they was discriminated against can be compensated for that, taking money out of their pocket. Probably the biggest thing is that by enforcing it, the person doesn't have to, um, the word gets around. It's kind of like the ramps, okay? Ramps are expensive. We're going to concede, uh, uh, we're going to concede that. They, they, 
and they are an expensive investment. And people say, well, why can't I, I'm just building stairs and I gotta have this ramp. But the reason is, is so people can get up. Well, if you are a university and you are operating um, in the United States, you're expected to provide ramps or lifts for uh, kids with disabilities. Now they say, well, this and that. Well, what the legal team is going to say is we don't want to have to deal with the Office of Civil Rights and we don't want to get fined. So it comes there. So, but the Office of Civil Rights gets pro proactive. Also, in terms of education, universities actually are investigated by the Office of Civil Rights out of the U.S. Department of Education. And it's the same thing. A person said, and the big thing right now is visually impaired or those that um, are not, when, when they everything went online, they uh, visually impaired or captioning or things along that line became necessary for students online for various disabilities. That became a very big operation um, to, for them to take, uh, take part in. Uh, it, it was much, but they had to go and the justice put in screen readers, to put in ways for testing, prolonged testing. Um, uh, they became a, a, a we can't, you, you, there's two things. If a person is has a hearing impairment, if you put the captioning down, you're assuming they know how to read. That's one thing that you have to be careful of. The other one, and so you use ASL, sign language. However, when you're using ASL, many of the young people don't use ASL anymore, haven't been taught it because they have CART, they have all the captionings. So that's becoming kind of a, a, a secondary source for people that are there. So they, you can't just put up ASL and think everybody is, is hearing you. They have other tools. So that becomes an issue, but they have to go there. It became, um, you can imagine the task. Okay, you're going to the Ohio State and you live in Missouri. So you go home to Missouri, but the ASL interpreter goes home to Maine. How do you get the ASL interpreter together with the student? And then there's things about ASL interpreters you may, may already know, but ASL interpreters work 15 minutes at a time and take 15 minutes off. So as a rule, they will be two interpreters for an hour long presentation. They will go 15 minutes and the next one steps in and then the one that just that would have a 15 minute break, they go off and give this one a break. So that can become uh, complicating also. So um, it's been a, a struggle in, in terms of that. Does that answer the question or am I answering it? Pia? Uh, I think so. Otherwise, people will have to speak up. Um, another person is asking, I would like to hear, uh, so there's multiple questions coming in now, George, just so you know. Okay. I would like to hear about the definition, your definition of uh, impairment. Okay, impairment is, okay. My, when I say impairment, with a disabled person, it is a part of them that prohibits them from participating fully in life. Okay, um, if you saw Doonesbury today in the comics, that seems kind of wild, but but uh, uh, Doonesbury today just kind of hit home. There, the the the. They're talking about the person who lost his leg in Vietnam, and his wife was there, Walter Reed, and they had to learn how to open an oven without falling down with a prosthetic or taking the pan out from underneath with a prosthetic. Okay, the person had a uh, prosthetic leg and had to learn how to use it safely. That's an impairment from, um, from full life. That's the full life is I gotta be able to just walk up to an oven like everybody else and open it, but I can't do that. So I should be able to enjoy the oven the same as anybody else. So the impairment is the leg and lack of it. Um, I should be able to, in my case, I'll put it this way, it, as I mentioned, balance. I should be able to go out and enjoy Disneyland and go about Disneyland. However, 
I have a propensity I do to be, um, shall we say, I can get stumbling, not, not just stumbling just because I got arthritis and I'm getting old, okay? E-bar keeps me from falling, okay? I have an impairment that keeps me from enjoying Disneyland. I have a service dog that allows me to enjoy it, if that makes it. In other words, it, an impairment is a characteristic that prevents people from fully enjoying their lives. Now, we're talking about physical impairments. Keep in mind, there are other impairments. Depression. Depression is a major problem for young people going to college. Because what is it about in depression? Depression, they don't want to get out of bed. Now, maybe the college kids don't get out of bed anyway. I don't know. I'm just kidding. But that's one of the things that are, uh, with depression. So a child uh, person goes off 18, 19, 20 years old with depression, and they have a very serious depressive um, uh, episode and can't get out of bed. All right. That's an impairment. In that, they miss the exam. Because of their impairment, they miss the exam. If they miss the exam, they fail. So they, there needs to be an accommodation for that. What they usually do is they have a testing center and the person can't see it. And they, if they miss the exam, they can still take it at the testing center where they have the exam. And the idea is the person can't see the exam or maybe a different exam. But that's another one. Um, mental impairments that, that come about. There, there can be autism, autism. Um, I had an autistic child, autistic child, here I go. I had a senior in, um, in a high school class that had severe autism and he was a rocker. Does everybody know what a rocker is? They, they give him vestibular stimulation to themselves and they rock back and forth, back and forth. So he would go in class and then he would start rocking. So we had to find a way. But the thing is, there was a time where Aunt, if he came in as a rocker, they wouldn't allow him in the class because it was too distracting. Now the class has to make exceptions for him, which means educating the class, educating actually him, what's going on, his impact, the class, the teacher, and what's involved. But that becomes an impairment that keeps him from fully enjoying life uh, is is his rocking with autism. And so um, if, that, if that gets the point across. Any, any Pia? Uh, yes. Um, okay. uh, what do you think of people who identify their pets as service animals? Well, that's, first off, I know there's a mini horse in the debate, but first there's only one type of first service animal in the American Disabilities Act now, and that's a dog. So there's, they say service animals, but only a dog can be a service animal. That dog needs to perform a task for the owner. The owner has to be one, disabled. Two, there has to be a, the owner has a task for the dog to assist the owner in access. That, and I believe that that needs to be held, held, held to a strict um, accountability. In California, they just passed a law, uh, AB 648, I think it's AB 648, that a person selling dogs as emotional support animals cannot identify them as service dogs. They are emotional support animals, which is entirely different. So they, they can't just say it's a service animal and then find out it's not. It's very, it becomes um, fraudulent. And I believe that it has to be held up. I know I'm on a listserv and people always say, well, can I take my ESA, emotional support animal, the class. And my answer is, please don't, because my service dog is trained and it goes around other dogs and it's great and it's been there. The trouble is emotional support animal is not. So I get a dog that's untrained or perhaps even undisciplined as emotional support animal in the same room as my service dog. And that doesn't go so well necessarily. 
there, there can be a support. So no, I don't. And the airlines, as an example, have really cracked down on that. They've, they've done that. And it's, it's a good thing. No, it's, I encounter very little fraud now with service dogs. There was, I saw it when, when I first started working with Evar. It was, it was kind of sickening. Everybody was walking on the plane with an emotional support animal. It could be a butt, bunny rabbit or a service dog that, you know, was yapping at everybody and kind of wee wee in the corner. You know, I, not quite that bad. But so that upsets me. So, no, I don't like it. And, but there is enforceable uh, action. And I, I don't, I do believe that they have to be carefully trained. And like one woman came up to me and says, Oh, I'm going to get a, a dog for epilepsy. I'm an epileptic. He says, how, how can I train it? And I said, well, actually for your dog, knowing you're going to have an ep, uh, epileptic uh, seizure, that will be very easy. That will be easy. And she looked at me and said, no, that's why you have a dog. Dogs are very empathetic. They will probably 10, 12 minutes before you have a seizure, begin to pick up the characteristics and know you're going to have a seizure. The challenge is, is how the dog is going to let you know that that's coming about. The dog just can't go around. So the, the dog will notify them. But the training comes is how does the dog let you know with certainty that if a seizure is coming, they, they're going to let them there. And she got it. She, she doesn't use one. So yes. So in answer to the question, I don't like it when people say my dog is a service dog. Um, but if the dog can perform a task, and the person is disabled, then the person uses it as a service dog, but needs to be held to a certain standard. Uh, the dog has to remain in control, can't be disruptive. Um, I don't know, I could go on with the whole list, but the biggest one seems to come about while well, they were barking and they were growling or they were disruptive. A dog, a uh, service dog shouldn't be doing that. And But remember, if a dog needs to leave a room because they are disruptive, does not mean the dog can't come back again, if that makes sense. The dog can return. Now, if it goes on habitually, then there's a problem. But it, so, next question. Then uh, there's uh, just two questions that I'm going to make into one. Uh, one is like, whether businesses can get help paying for disability ramps. And another one is that um, somebody talked to an architect that did projects in the United States and was told that architects could be sued uh, if projects are not uh, built and not accessible. So do you know anything about how businesses uh, need to go about it and is it all out of pocket or is there like a can they that becomes that's a good question and like united airlines yeah it's going to be out of your pocket i mean because they're making money <laughs> they're making money off of off of the operation beyond that i really can't answer answer the question entirely i would imagine that count i well i do know from my position in city council that there are funds available when a city puts in the street and the and the um the uh disabled ramps go in the curb cuts go in are put in for the sidewalks um there are funds along those lines that can be applied for or grants and they come in uh, grants as you know they come and go i'm not sure if there's a steady income flow but they do exist as far as architects i i wouldn't be surprised let's put it this way an architect that knows their business would not design a building without putting in the necessary ramps and i would imagine that if the person who's building it says those have to come out that the architect would just kind of walk away their license is on the line as to legal ramifications, I would imagine if the architect says, hey, I'll take care of that and altered it, then yeah, I would imagine they would come after the architect as well as the person in the building. But uh, I can't imagine that an architect with their salt building a new building would leave out those architectural designs in them and put them in. 
as as necessary um, from what I, I've seen. There is a thing that's going on, and here I agree with it too. If you have a building that hasn't been modified, say prior to the ADA or an older building that has not been renovated or, or um, uh, redesigned or remodeled, that you don't need to comply with that. That becomes a problem in say small town Midwestern city, small town Kansas, because they have old restaurants there that don't have ramps and the owners don't want to put them in It's costly. And number two, they may not be able to afford them, but they can't be sued because they haven't done any work on the building. So, so the person goes through and it's there. They were talking about the ADA that you could sue them and Congress kind of backed away and I can understand they did because there are attorneys that drive around and will look for openings. So if they pass a law that every building had to have a ramp and they drive through small town Kansas where no building had a ramp and they sued everybody, they would put the, a lot of businesses out, out of business and really put in, um, encumber the, the uh, city for, um, for what um, encumber the city and its residents for the ADA on um, sudden change and people couldn't comply right away. The ramps are not, they're not cheap. I mean, they, they're, they're, they're an expense. And I disagree. I, I agree that they, the people shouldn't be subjected to that. So I don't know what the solution is because I imagine there's a few people in the Midwest that haven't redesigned their building because they don't want to put in the ramp, but <clears throat> that's neither here nor there. So any others? Um, yes, uh, somebody's asking, is there a, like a impairments prioritized? No, and that's a good question. And that we can go into later, but no. Um, if it's an, an impairment, it, they're, all, they're all in equity. And- Can they then be like, can, can um, can uh, two impairments then be like doing, getting the opposite, needing the opposite attention? I'm not quite sure I follow that. I mean, they're offsetting or? Um, that if to accommodate them, they would need the opposite accommodation or conflicting accommodation. Is there like, is that ever, have you ever heard if that is a, uh, no, I, I haven't. I haven't heard of that. An impairment, impairment isn't an impairment is something that limits your ability to enjoy life. I can't imagine an impairment that will enhance that ability. It wouldn't be an impairment if it's enhancing your life. It's off. It's not an impairment, but you still have the other impairment. I, I, that's a legal question, and I'm going to back away from it. But that's the best way I can say okay. it. And say it. We'll leave so, it at that then. Right. And then um, in high school, I was a substitute teacher. Um, and there was an autistic person, and he was continually throwing a tem uh, tantrums and was hit, start hitting people and becoming more and more violent. And he had to be restrained by the guard and, and then accompanied into a separate room. He was, this was high school and he was six foot tall. How would you suggest, or is there like guidelines um, that he could be integrated into a classroom? Well, first, I think what first has to be put across is that is not acceptable behavior. Obviously, you can't have a student striking another student or walking around just striking things. There's head, head butters. To, uh, to deal with that. And now we're talking about the Individual Social Education Act. There should be an, um, an individual education plan for that student that addresses that behavior. If he's in the, and I would have to, there you have to get into a lot of, of factors. There's a, a psychologist comes in and looks at it. What is going on? There can be with 
with that, are there triggers? There's behavioral ones. Are there triggers in the classroom that are causing this? Can those triggers be eliminated? Can the student deal with the triggers? How is this being manifested? Once that's there, then everybody comes together, parents, students, um, teachers, administrators, what are we going to do? Now, what I've often done with those cases is that they will integrate them slowly. They will get, they will have special day classes. Nobody really, your worst day in a regular classroom is better than the best day in a special day class. That's what I always say. But they do have special day classes for some, but they would integrate them. I would say that they would be looking at a one-on-one -on -one aid. In other words, when he's in the classroom, there would be an aid sitting with him that would spot the trigger and calm the child down or remove the child so the teacher doesn't have to deal with them. That doesn't mean, just because they're in special education and can't go there, it doesn't mean that they can't be escorted out of the room if they're starting to become belligerent. Uh, substitute teachers, I, I tell you, I used to, I substitute taught when I was um, getting my teacher credential, God bless you. Yeah, I was, <laughs> there were people, I, I usually got it, got the hint when I was in one school and I was told to go to the other school because the teacher, the special substitute their teacher there had to leave in an emergency. And I get down there and that's where I found instances like yours are like, I don't believe what's going on in this room. And of course, I'm the substitute, so you know they're gonna they're just gonna deal with the uh, leave leave me with it. So, but in answer to it, there should be an, an edu individual education plan in place. There should be some sort of accommodation to ensure the child gets the education in the classroom within the classroom, even if that means they need a one-on-one -on -one aid, and that the student needs to be removed that 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 type of behavior is is obviously not good and not not acceptable uh keep in mind some school districts when i was teaching special ed um they don't want to spend the money so they'll put them in a movie class so so and the movie class it keeps it's there to keep the kids happy judy has her hand up yeah, can, I'd like to add to that because that was actually my question. Um, the guard was with him at all times. He was the personal aide, and I think there was a second person with him too at all times. Um, there obviously was an IEP plan in place. The um, problem was that the parent has the final say on that, and she did not want him to go any place but the regular school environment, which he could not participate in. Yes, that that is a difficult one. And now you're getting into reality that parents can, can pull a lot and how much does the school want to pay and how much strong can they be with it, be with them? Uh, the, as you know, Judy, it's fate free and um, public education is the standard. But to, so a stu student needs to have a free and public education. However, however, in the least restrictive environment, but that when you say the least restrictive environment means that there can be a restrictive environment. And which I think you were experiencing is just, you get into political dynamics, you get into other dynamics in the school, it just doesn't have the courage to stand up to them um, to do it. So they say, okay, we'll give it a try. But the parents advocating for the child, I can understand that. Sure, any parent, I would imagine most parents would want their kid in a regular classroom. However, the least restrictive environment means that there can be restriction. And if the student is a danger to himself or others, then, then we, have a, we have a serious situation. And to answer how you deal with that, it's just like you said, I would have to know the child and go through the whole IEP process before I could comment on what, what could be done with the child. I, because who knows? I don't, All I, don't I can know tell child. you, um, that news for him was very noisy because he was continually hitting the walls. Yeah, so. well that's, and now he's endangering himself too. So I, I'm sorry you had to go through that, but. It, 
it's I can see that happening. And just like you said, the parent comes in there and and they have the right connection with the superintendent and the principal gets scared and all of a sudden the students were the not to be, but <clears throat> I don't know how this, uh, how that's something that, that happens and it's unfortunate and hopefully it gets corrected in best interest for the child is what we're trying to do. And that that's not in the best interest of the child. Thank you so much, George. I think we got to the end of the questions and we got to the end of the hour. Um, this has been super interesting and eye-opening for sure. And um, and the hour went really fast, I thought. So thank you everybody for joining us and thank you very much for speaking, George. Thank you. I'm so passionate with me, so with disability. So <laughs> someday maybe I'll say some more. <laughs> anyway, thank you.